What is it like to learn online with NEC? When you learn online with NEC, you're in charge. You can study when, where and how you like, alongside your other commitments. You set your own study timetable. As an educational charity, our main aim is to support you throughout your course. Start by choosing the course you want to study, then enrol online or by phone. Our experienced and friendly course advice team are here to advise you. We offer flexible payment plans to help you spread the cost of your course. Your highly qualified personal tutor will guide and help you progress. We'll send you login details so you can start your course. Our getting started section will help you find your way around. Our high quality learning materials are developed by experts who know what you need to learn and practice to succeed. You can access your course at any time. Share ideas with other students on the discussion forums. Study your course online in a way that suits you or print resources and study offline. Courses have a clear structure with sections and topics. At the end of each section, you'll complete and submit an assignment to your tutor. Your tutor will give you valuable feedback to help you progress. Assignments give you essential practice in answering exam type questions. We can mark non-examined assessment, such as coursework and practical science endorsements. When you've completed the course, you'll have achieved your goal and valuable skills as an independent learner. As your next step, talk to our course advice team if you have any questions. When you're ready, enrol online or by phone. Remember, NEC is here to help you achieve your goals. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, today, I'm very pleased to welcome Heidi Tiemann, who is um, a fount of knowledge around uh, careers in space. And I'll let Heidi introduce herself now. Hi there, and thank you so much for having me, Esther. My name's Heidi Tiemann, and I am a project manager at the Cornwall Space and Aerospace Technology Training Programme based in Cornwall, which in Penworth College. So I'm looking forward to being here. Thank you so much. So this is part of a series of webinars that National Extension College has been delivering. Um, this one, as we said, focused on careers in space and we've got, got some slides and presentation from Heidi soon. As you've just seen in the messages, please do say hello. Um, nice to know we've got some people out there, so please say hi. Um, we, we would love to hear from you, and if you've got any comments to make or just say where you're, you're sort of dialing in from, that would be really good as well. Um, once we've been through the presentations, there will be time for Q&A. Um, so we'll hold that at the end and that will be with myself and Heidi. So if it's any questions regarding the presentation Heidi's given or if it's something around the National Extension College and GCSEs or A-levels, hopefully between us, we'll be able to answer those. If you have got a burning question throughout, please do type it in the box. Um, we'll either see it and answer it straight away if we feel it's a good moment to. Or we can um, look at it at the end and we'll just pull up any of the questions that have come throughout the delivery so we can address those at the end. Um, you will, if you've registered by Eventbrite, you will get the slides and information sent on. So please don't worry if you're scribbling away, making notes at all, you will get those. Um, and also please um, do have a check out on our YouTube channel where we have lots more um, webinars um, that we've delivered, such as land-based careers, um, webinars with different universities. So if this one piques your interest, please do have a look. So I'm just going to live, give a little introduction to the National Extension College. There was a video playing at the beginning as we welcomed you into the um, webinar. Um, we're a, a pioneer of online distance learning. So we were set up in the 60s, um, not online at that point. We moved to online um, as soon as possible. Um, and now our students have access to our learning materials through an online portal. Our learning design is very crucial to the core of what we do. So we do specialise in GCSEs and A-levels. And it is self-study, self-learning. Um, so you can learn at any time at your own pace. 
um, but you are supported by a tutor. So our material is all developed to move you through the course and move you through your learning to reach your end goal, which may be to have the knowledge, or it may be to have the knowledge and to gain the qualification. So we do um, facilitate examinations as well. So part of what we do, we have lots of different material that um, engages you throughout the course when you're online, when you're registered with us online. And um, there's a few screenshots here from geography and from chemistry, I think. Um, so it's interactive. You're working through the material yourself. But also you have access to a tutor. So your tutor is a really important person within the self-study, self-learning um, environment because you can message them throughout the portal. You can also contact your cohort if there's other students online. You can ask questions as a group, start a discussion. Um, your tutor will uh, engage with you on the um, platform and through the messaging. But they will also really importantly mark your work. So what they do is they ensure that your work is um, to the standard that's required for the final examination. And they'll make sure that you have um, the knowledge and identify any gaps that you might have. We also have um, pastoral support, as any college or university would. Um, and this is important as well, because we understand that if you're self-learning, you're self-studying, it might be that you need a little bit of additional support or some guidance or signposting to additional support. So we have a pastoral officer who will contact you if you've declared you've got an additional need or may contact you anyway, just to check in, see everything's OK. We also have a UCAS um, service, and this is really important if you're looking to move on to higher education. We are UCAS Centre, so we'll ensure that you can progress through to, through to your cho university of choice. Um, and part of that, we also engage with the National Career Service, who will give you careers advice if university and higher education isn't where you're looking to go, but you're exploring different careers. This is a real student. This is Holly. Um, that's that's just her first name. Um, so Holly took the decision to leave school at year 10 because for varying reasons, it wasn't working out as an environment for her. Um, but obviously Holly wanted, as it says, wanted to progress onto A-levels. So she did enrol with the National Extension College. And the reason I've chosen this case study is um, Holly enrolled in astronomy. So Holly was really excited about astronomy and found that a really interesting course to study. There aren't that many online distance learning providers who um, deliver the GCSE in astronomy. Really good course, lots of interaction you can do, and also some field work that we facilitate and support you with. So it really gets you out looking at the sky. And that's obviously a very good segue into the presentation that we have from um, Heidi. So Heidi, I'm going to stop sharing and I think we're going to load up your presentation. Um, hopefully that's given everybody an insight into who we are as a National Extension College. Um, and Heidi, do you want to start off as your presentation starts to load? Fab, thanks so much. It is, yeah, it's absolutely great to hear about Holly there because I, I, I did GCSE astronomy myself actually quite a long time ago, but I remember it was something that really did help me. Um, so I hope you can see that. Um, it's I'm just coming, just... yeah, we've got it. Perfect. And that means I can see you down here in case you need to wave at me. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, fantastic. OK, so hi, everyone. And thank you so much to the NEC for having me here today. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like this is particularly fitting, actually, because I've got this career in astronomy and in the uh, space industry. But I also um, did some study at the Open University before. It's where I got my PhD in astrophysics. So I do know all about distance learning. Um, I was on campus, but I did teach distance learning students. And I know how valuable it is for uh, people's careers. So sorry, just bash the, <laughs> bash the space bar key there. Um, but let me introduce myself. So I am Dr Heidi Tiemann and I am the project manager of the Cornwall Space and Aerospace Technology Training Programme. Um, I'm based down in Cornwall, um, but I've worked all over the UK and actually um, different parts of the world before with my space career. And so over the next kind of half an hour-ish, I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the space sector, where the jobs are, uh, what skills you might need to join the space sector, and how you can kind of progress 
through education into that first space job. But before we do that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about who I am um, and what I do. Um, so I have always been interested in space. Um, so for me, it's been quite a natural career path. As a young kid, I used to basically wait outside in the garden at night to catch satellites passing overhead. So in particular, I was really interested in this type of satellite called an Iridium satellite. Um, this is an, a satellite that glints really brightly compared to others. And it kind of shows these things in the night sky called Iridium flares. So the sun catches off the satellites and bounces into your eye down on Earth. So um, that was something that kind of really got me into space at the start. So as I grew up, um, I knew that space was something I wanted to do. So I spent quite a lot of time trying to be involved in things related to space in any sort of way. Basically, ast astronomy, being an astronaut, all of that sort of cool stuff. So when I was a teenager, I joined the Air Cadets um, because I thought I should learn to fly if I want to be an astronaut and want to go to space, right? Um, so I, I did that and I, I learned to fly glider planes. Um, I went to something called Space School UK in the summer, which was a summer camp all about space and astronomy. And there I built rockets and launched them and to, to kind of varying degrees of success. So for me, having done that at the kind of GCSE stage, then it helped me pick my A-level choices. So I knew at that point I wanted to work in the space industry and I thought I should choose physics, chemistry, geography, maths and further maths. Didn't do very well in the further maths, so I'll be completely honest, maths wasn't my strong point. Um, but I also did a GCSE in astronomy, like Holly as well. Um, so this, for me, kind of led me on to doing a degree at the University of Leicester in uh, physics with space science and technology. Um, and this is where I got involved in projects where you use telescopes to look for transiting exoplanets um, or looking at how you can solve the space debris, debris problem by trying to capture satellites and bring them back down to Earth. Um, so when I was also a student at university, I got really involved in something called UK SEDS. Uh, which was um, or is the, the National Student Society for Space. And then once I got involved in that, I got involved in loads of other things like space careers, which I'll talk about a little more later. Um, and I ended up um, kind of being really involved in the space sector outreach education there. After my degree, um, I knew I still wanted to be involved in space. So I went on to do a PhD in astrophysics um, so I got to travel to places like South Africa, where um, I got to use some of the biggest telescopes in the world and study binary stars. So binary stars are stars which are two stars which orbit one another, a little bit like how the Earth orbits the sun. But instead, you've got two stars orbiting one another. And I was particularly focused on stars which essentially are too close, too red and too cold for what we would usually expect. And I was working out how they formed basically how the stars were born, how they got into being so close to one another, and how they might end their star life by crashing into each other and forming kind of stunning stellar explosions in the night sky. So whilst I was doing a PhD though, um, I ended up founding a small company, um, which is um, looking at data to do with the space industry. And then um, following that, I, I was looking to, to um, work kind of more in the space industry, not in academia, but I wanted to, to kind of stay within that kind of education, that skills side of things. And I was lucky enough to find a space job in Cornwall, which has been um, a bit of a dream for a long time for me. So very briefly, um, what I now do at the moment is I work as the project manager of something called the Cornwall Space and Aerospace Technology Training Programme, or CSAT for sure. Um, CSAT is essentially a project which is um, developing training for businesses to help their workforce. We're also developing new qualifications like space HNCs and HNDs, as well as apprenticeship programs. And we also work on outreach activities like space camps and trying to get people into the space sector and give them opportunities to work in space. Um, and what's really nice is we're supported by quite a lot of universities and companies both in Cornwall and around the UK. But I'll tell you a little bit more about the space apprenticeships and qualifications later um, and kind of feed that into some of the things that you could do. So by signing up to this webinar or watching it later, 
I'm kind of guessing that you might be interested in a career in space or finding out a bit about one. So before we start, I basically wanted to provide a few caveats. So in this session, I'm going to be talking about routes into the space sector, but I want to remember that there are no perfect routes in. I've done quite a stereotypical route because that is all I knew of at the time and I followed that path. But nowadays there is so much more career information out there about space. And this means that you can follow different pathways into the sector. You can go one way and then come back. You can uh, join the space sector and leave and come back again. There isn't a perfect way of getting into the space sector. So whatever qualifications you choose to do are valuable ones. My best piece of advice would honestly be to do something that you enjoy and find a career pathway that suits you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a quiz. I'm not going to ask people to uh, comment or anything or put their hands up or stuff like that. Um, basically, in your head, I want you to think for a second about what types of jobs there are in the space sector. So you might think that space is all about being an astronaut and that's the thing we see most on tv or in films but in fact there's only about 15 or so european and british astronauts including tim peake who went to space um, a few years ago um, so a really short quiz to try and kind of test your knowledge as a of the space sector is what is the breakdown of jobs at the european space agency the, the kind of europe-wide organization for space how many or what percentage of people work in each role? So I'll let you think for a second, and then we'll go through them. So I'm gonna start with engineers and analysts, kind of these are the people who might be doing thermal engineering, working on satellites or spacecraft, or on things like big satellite antenna on the ground. Um, well, these make up about 45% of the jobs in the space industry. So if you're working in the space sector, it's actually quite likely you might be an engineer. What about scientists and astronauts? Well, that's only about 7%. So, so you remember I said that there's only about 15 or so astronauts. The rest of that is scientists. So scientists are maybe astronomers or planetary scientists, the people working on some of the data releases you might have seen in the last few days with the James Webb Space Telescope. These would be a lot of the scientists working on uh, in the European Space Agency. We've now got managers and support professionals and admin and technical staff. These are the people that kind of make a business happen. So we'll go through these ones quickly. We've got managers, about 12%, support professionals, about 16%, and admin and technical staff, about 20%. So I think from this, what's really interesting to me is how at the European Space Agency and in most space companies around the world, about half the jobs are in engineering and science, and the other half of the jobs are in management, in policy, administration and in business. And at the end of the day, so the space industry is a business. And without people with the knowledge of the engineering, the science and the knowledge of the business and the law and the policy, space wouldn't function. So hopefully you can see that whatever kind of your interest, there is something for you. So my next question is, how many space jobs can you actually name? I think I've given you a bit of a head start with this question on the previous slide, but have a think for a second. I'm going to go through some of them here, some of the normal ones you might expect and some of the unusual ones. So we've got our kind of stereotypical ones, our astronaut, astronomer, astrophysicist, your spacecraft operator, your aerospace engineer. There's the ones that normally people can name. Then we've got maybe ones which you might be able to think of, but a bit less commonly named your engineers, different types of engineers, and your computer scientists and your software developers. You've then got uh, your, your kind of planetary scientists and your geologists and geodesists and meteorologists and all the ologists. And these are a lot of the people who use space data, take it from satellites and apply it to life on Earth to try and improve life on Earth. You've also got some really niche space jobs like analog astronauts. And these are people who trial being astronauts to work out how we cope with being in an enclosed environment. But you've also got astronaut trainers, space medics, you've got space psychologists who help astronauts train for a mission in space. You've then got the people who actually work in the business side of things, your space lawyers, your international relations, your finance managers, your administrative assistants. These are the people that keep all the businesses going, 
and you've got the people who kind of sell the businesses out to other people, your entrepreneurs, your marketers, your communications officers, teachers, outreach officers and journalists. These are kind of people who make space um, a kind of exciting place to be and sell the industry to people. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of how broad the range of jobs are in the space sector. Um, but next, I want to talk a little bit about the types of companies that, that you can actually work in. Oh, there we go. So um, in the space sector, we typically split companies into two categories. Uh, we split them into the upstream and the downstream. So the upstream, kind of as it sounds, is focused on getting stuff up into space. So that is uh, building rockets, testing rockets and satellites, doing a lot of software and sending stuff up into space. You've then got the downstream space sector, and you might have guessed that is about bringing space data down to Earth and using it for different applications. So this might be um, as kind of simple as taking pictures of the Earth and then using that um, for maybe flood detection, or it might be a bit more complicated. So you might be scanning different parts of the Earth or you might be um, beaming down positioning data so people can even use GPS or Google Maps to try and get to where you are. So I thought I'd show you some of the companies that are in each sector. So in the upstream space sector, these are where you often have some of the really big name companies. You've got rocket companies like Skyrora and Orbex and Virgin Orbit. And these are the ones that are sending rockets up into space or building things. You've got um, some of the space defence companies like Lockheed Martin, you've got satellite companies like Airbus and Clyde Space and RAL Space, and you've even got companies, very new ones like Spaceforge, who are trying to build um, mini ma manufacturing sites to build actual uh, kind of pharmaceuticals or new materials in space. So you might recognise some of these logos, and it's definitely not an exhaustive list. What about the downstream though? Well, these are often companies that um, are a bit more kind of maybe sometimes harder to link to the space industry on the surface. Um, so you've got companies like Sky, um, the, the people who provide you with your TV. Well, the way they do that is they actually have a whole load of satellites around the world and they beam satellite TV to your house using the antennas and the dishes on your roof. They are a space company in a way. We've also got the Met Office who use satellites to predict weather. And we've got people like um, Cornish Lithium who use satellite data to find the best places to mine lithium that can uh, then go into our electric vehicles. So there's a whole range of companies there. So that's just a kind of small range really of the jobs and companies in the space sector. But if you're considering working in space in the future, you might want to know about where you might be working. So at the moment, um, a lot of the space industry is located in the south and the southeast and the Midlands. Um, so one of the main areas is the Harwell Space Campus, which is a really large research and science park with a particle accelerator and some really cool things like that. And it's chock full of space companies. But there's also some kind of localised space hubs in Bristol, in Leicester, in Cornwall. Uh, Southampton and now in kind of Glasgow and Edinburgh so there's a whole range of places that you could live and work in the UK but there's also the wider European kind of space industry so space is a really international industry so there's loads of opportunities to live and work abroad so for many people this would mean working at a European space agency site um, and they've got a whole load of main sites across Europe so they've got, for example, ESTEC in the Netherlands, ESOC and EMETSAT in Germany. You've got uh, ESAC, which is the European Astronomy Centre in Spain, which is very beautiful. You get a chance to go out there, very hot at this time of year. Um, but then you've also got some other kind of centres which aren't European Space Agency centres, but have a lot of space companies like Toulouse and Bremen and Turin in Italy. So there's, there's quite a lot of opportunities for people to branch out into Europe. Um, even with Brexit as well. Um, for those with dreams of working at NASA, um, it's not impossible, but it is tricky. Um, I'd recommend doing a lot of your own research there, but essentially there is something that you will have to look at called ITAR, I -T -A -R, um, which often restricts foreign nationals from working for uh, American space companies. But that is a whole other thing, so I'll let you do your own research if you have dreams of working for NASA. Focus on Europe. Europe's got some great space companies in. 
And just because I uh, live and work in Cornwall, I thought I'd just show you the range of companies that we have down here. So if you happen to be based in Cornwall, you're in luck. Um, there's about 100 or so space and space related companies in our Cornwall space cluster, which means that there are lots of opportunities to study, to do work experience and to even be employed in the space industry here. But for anyone else who isn't in Cornwall, there's often a space cluster quite nearby. Um, and I will send a link um, to, uh, to Joe, who will send one out around later, so you can find your nearest space cluster if you're interested. So that's a bit about what some of the jobs are and where you can work in space. But what about um, why might you want to work in space? And one of the reasons um, that people often say, well, I don't know about space is because they don't really know how much you might get paid. And actually, what's quite nice is that space pays really well. So if you are considering how much you might want to be paid in the future, um, well, you'd be pleased to know that the average space job in the UK has a salary of about £49,000 a year, which is pretty great. Um, this obviously depends on how senior you are, what type of job you do and other factors. But if you're looking for a career that does pay well and is exciting, space might be for you. So if you do want to make some of the highest salaries in the space sector, the best paying jobs, as a bit of a hint um, before you even start, management sales and policy, and then engineering, there's some of the top paying areas. And if you haven't yet decided on what you want to do as a degree or a higher level qualification, then to get the best salaries, I would recommend studying business, electronics engineering, computer science or maths. They are some of the areas that will get you the highest salaries in the space sector. So a bit of an advanced hint there. Now, if you are thinking, this sounds great, there's space nearby, there's a cool job, um, you get paid well, and you think space is for me, how do you actually start? what sort of qualifications and experience do you need? What do you actually need to study to get a space job or to get some of that experience? Well, as I said earlier, there isn't really one particular route into the space industry. I've tried to simplify this diagram a bit, but there are so many ways that you can work in space. So um, I, there's, I think there'll be people of different levels here, but I'm going to go from kind of GCSE upwards, so then it covers everyone. So, if you're looking at your GCSEs, um, as long as you've got a broad base and you've got that English and maths, most courses will accept you. And that is kind of the key thing. But when you're looking at your kind of uh, level three qualifications, your A levels, your T levels, your B techs for your apprenticeships, um, you might want to choose one, like I said earlier, that will get you into the space industry. That sort of engineering, physics, maths, business. They are some good areas, but you might also want to consider if you want to work with satellite data, Computer science, geography, software development, or even biology can be really useful kind of subjects to study. So for those that then want to do a vocational route, there's quite a few apprenticeships which are now available in the space industry. A lot are in engineering or software development, and there's a few, um, they're not as many, but there are a few in the business related areas too. So after your level three, your kind of school or college qualifications, um, you might want to progress your education um, with a degree or a degree apprenticeship. So a lot of the, the space sector have chosen to do a physics or engineering degree, but you don't have to. You can choose a subject you enjoy. But physics and engineering are good and they are probably some of the easiest ways of then getting into the space sector. If you do a degree qualification, you might want to spend some of your time doing uh, in the summer doing an internship or a placement so you can gain experience at a real space company. Or you may not want to do that and you may want to go directly into a space company, get a job there and work your way up. Again, there's lots of routes and lots of options. Then once you've got that experience, you've got your qualifications, you've maybe got an internship or some work experience, you then might go into a full-time space job um, or you might want to continue education. Um, like I, I really did enjoy education for me. So I did do a master's degree and a PhD before going to find a space job. You don't have to do that, um, but it is an option. And then you could also go into the space industry after that. But as I said, it's really up to you. So this is where I'm going to give a very quick plug for what I've been doing over the last year in terms of space qualifications. And 
I've really been focusing with the CSAT project on developing uh, vocational routes into the space sector. And these are kind of routes which are, they have existed in the space sector, but we've taken them, written some new qualifications and really refined them. So over the last year, we've been developing a new space HNC and HND. So it's called the Space Technology HNC or HND. And this is a vocational qualification that you can do um, either as a standalone or it aligns with a space apprenticeship. So it means you get two qualifications for the price of one, which is great. Um, and this is a qualification which is starting off this year in September in Cornwall. And then it will be available to any other college um, later on um, after September to deliver so that um, anyone in the country, um, whether you're remote, whether you're in person, might be able to study a space technology HNC. Um, this means that um, hopefully in 2025 or so, there will then be a space systems engineer degree apprenticeship. Just have to wait for the universities to sign off on that one. And then if you're interested in doing space engineering as a degree, that will also be an option. So this means you get paid to learn while you earn, and it's a really great kind of opportunity to gain experience in the space industry. So that's kind of a quick plug for what I've been doing. Um, I'm happy to put a link in the chat later as well, but it's something that I'm glad will be kind of open to um, the rest of the UK soon. So if you want to gain some space experience in the near future, and maybe you don't want to do a good degree right yet, or you haven't got the qualifications just yet and you're thinking about the future, but here's a kind of a few things that you can do now. Um, so um, if you, well, actually, if you are at university or you are thinking about university in the future, um, you might want to look at something called the Space Placements in Industry Scheme. This is an eight week paid internship where you can work at a space company in the UK and it's coordinated by the UK Space Agency. There's about 50 placements available each year um, and it's one of the best ways to get experience in the space sector. But if you're not quite at that level yet, there's also opportunities to do space work experience. Some of them are online, like the virtual work experience series that's been running over the last few years. And they've been with Airbus, Spaceport Cornwall, some really kind of great companies there. Um, or you could get involved in space competitions. So there are competitions like um, the Olympus Rover Trials or the National Rocketry Competition, where you get to design your own rover, build it, test it in a fake Mars lab, um, and see how well it might do on Mars. Or you might get to launch your own rocket um, and compete to kind of see who can get the highest rocket in, um, in, in the UK. There's quite a few great competitions like that. If internships um, aren't kind of at your level right yet, work experience maybe isn't for you right now, or competition aren't, competitions aren't your thing, there's also a few other options. So I mentioned earlier that I went to something called Space School UK. There's actually a lot of space camps and space schools around the UK at the moment, which are open to people of all different ages. And there's also the European Space Camp in Norway, where again, it's open to people of different ages and you can go to Norway and launch a rocket, which is fantastic. Um, but if that's not for you, then my, my other suggestion is then looking at um, some of the great science and space outreach events that you could get involved in throughout the year. Um, one I'll highlight is the upcoming Goonhilly 60 Festival. Goonhilly Earth Station is um, this fantastic site down in Cornwall, which is not far from me, um, where they have a whole host of satellite dishes or antenna um, and they are holding a music festival where you can watch bands underneath some of the, the satellite antenna that you can see in the image on the right. Um, and there are lots of festivals like that around the UK, like the Jodrell Bank Blue Dot Festival, where you can actually get really up and close with some really cool space kit. So those are things I would kind of recommend having a bit of a look at. Um, so after you've gained internships, work experience, skills, qualifications, experience. I know that sounds like a lot, but what else can you do? Well, one thing I would really recommend is networking. And it sounds like with the, the NEC portal, there's some really great opportunities to actually talk to fellow students, to peers, to, to lecturers and staff. So really do take advantage of that. Um, but with the space industry, again, try and do the same thing. Space 
is actually still a really small industry in the UK and it is worth knowing people. Um, obviously it's good to have qualifications but if you do know people then it makes it a lot easier to be at a conference or at an event. You can kind of go up to someone and say oh, I know you I can have a chat and it's great. I think one of the things or one of the events I would really recommend going to if you do get a chance is something called the National Student Space Conference. And this is an annual conference held by UK SEDS. It rotates around the UK every year. So I don't know where it's going to be next year, but it will be March, the first weekend of March next year. And that is a conference for young people, for students who are interested in the space sector. There's a whole load of talks, there's a careers fair. Um, there's um, kind of opportunities to network with other people who are interested in the space industry and it's something that I would really recommend getting involved in. So you can see a nice photo of all the friendly people there from a couple of years ago just pre-pandemic. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. So I know I've only got a limited amount of time really to talk to you today um, so I want to leave you with a few useful bits of information um, and a couple of hints. Again, I think these links will be sent around to people, so don't worry about scribbling them down now. But if you are interested in learning more about careers in the space industry, then I'd really, really recommend checking out the website spacecareers.uk. And this is a website um, which is for young people or for early careers people looking to get jobs in the space industry. And it's run entirely by young people as well. Um, so it's got some really great advice, events, jobs um, and kind of kind of news articles, as well as interviews with people who work in the space industry at the moment. It might also be worth looking at the UK SEDS website, the UK Space Agency Careers website um, and some of the Royal Astronomical Society, Institute of Physics and European Space Agency websites too. I'm also going to just flag the space.ktn landscapes website. Um, it's a website which also shows you a map of where all the space companies in the UK are. So it's a little bit slow to load, but it does work really well if you want to try and find out where some of the nearest space companies are in case you wanted to reach out for work experience or an internship or a job in the future. So we'll pass on those links to you um, for later. So I think that's probably everything for me for the moment. Um, but thank you so much for listening and I'm going to take any questions if you have them um, and hopefully some of this has been helpful to you so thank you very much. Thank you Heidi that was wonderful really in depth and it sounds like a busy sector which is lots of, yeah festivals and lots of events um, careers events and opportunities to link with industry which is vital obviously at any stage as you said whether it's a stage where you're deciding what career or whether you've made the decision you're just trying to get a little bit more hands-on experience so Really good to hear, and thank you, as we said, we'd share those links. I love the Space School UK. So you went to that, did you say, or did you went, went, to, you went to a space camp? Uh, yeah, so I went to Space School UK when I was 15, um, and then I went back again a kind of year or so later. Um, and there are now quite a few around the UK. So mm -hmm. there's a Scottish Space School, Space School Kent, there's Space School in Leicester, there's a Space School in Cornwall, so there's, there's quite a few which are happening around the UK, but they're, they're quite good fun for getting to know other people and yeah. doing some really cool activities. Yes, I remember taking my children to the National Space Centre in, in Leicester, isn't it? So that way, which is great, really day out. Um, we've got a few very nice comments. So everybody saying thank you, really informative. Just a couple of sort of questions, um, books and records, just saying that around the, the broad range of qualifications and courses you could study. You gave a really good overview of the different types of careers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and books and records have said, obviously, that geography was a, not a surprise, but it's like, oh, I hadn't thought of geography actually being of a... And business was a surprise to me, I must admit. There's statistics yeah. you put up around, well, actually, if you go through a business management route, you can have a career in space. Are there any really unusual courses that people have then moved into the space mm. from that you're aware of? Yes, there's, I mean, there's, there's, you can link space to almost any subject you like if you, if you, if you kind of get enough connections. But I think one that I like is um, the space medicine um, type oh, link. Yeah. So not necessarily being a doctor, but um, someone I saw a great presentation from um, someone who was trying to develop a new technology for how you do operations in space. Mm -hmm. So 
um, liquid in space doesn't really doesn't drop down. Um, so if you're trying to do an operation, there's some blood. It won't just drop. It will just pool around the wound. So what you have to do is you have to try and suck it down using capillary tubes. So the capillary tubes you might use in biology or chemistry. Um, and you have to try and create a vacuum, little chamber around maybe an arm or a limb. Um, so there's actually a mix between the kind of medical understanding, but also the technological understanding. So there's a whole kind of area around developing new equipment for space, which I think is really quite cool. Yeah, very good. So as you said, you can almost link any any career to a, any course to a career in space. Thanks, Heidi. We've got a question from Karen. Um, so you've taught, you gave a really good sort of visual and, and you, you gave good sort of commentary on the different areas, these hubs, these space sector hubs. Um, is it an expanding sector? Do you see more areas of the UK gaining those sorts of hubs and those clusters of industries? Mm, yes, um, it's, it is really a really growing sector and especially with um, launch happening quite soon. Some of the areas that maybe weren't so spacey before like the highlands of scotland and cornwall are becoming quite um, significant space hubs mm -hmm. so the uk space agency has funded around 17 space hubs in the uk um, and these are areas where there's a lot of growth in the space industry where there's going to be more jobs more opportunities um, and i think one of the most recent ones is actually around uh, northumbria newcastle okay. um, so that's working with some of their their kind of original manufacturing industry but how that can be tweaked for the space sector so some really interesting clusters there good good and um thank you for sharing your course development they look great you know obviously what the industry and the sector needs some really sort of sort of quite broad but specific at different stages so you've got hsc mm -hmm. hnd um will they be available online or are you looking to do them in any way um, or do they need to be quite sort of um college based and i know you're looking to broaden it out to other providers yeah i think some of it can definitely be um online um, right. i think some of the some of the options would maybe need an engineering an engineering workshop or access mm -hmm. but I think there are options to switch out modules for, mm -hmm. um, so for example, you could switch a practical engineering for a CAD, so um, computer-aided design module, for example, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. can be done on a computer. Um, right. So there, I think there are options that will be becoming available in, in the future. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. So it, be, it will become more and more flexible as things develop. With, yeah, with... I think that is the hope. Yeah. This is a classic question. We've got lots of competitive, some very well-known names looking at space travel. Um, what's, what are your thoughts on that and the aspect of commercial space travel? Do you, do you sort of have a feeling that that's going to happen within a certain amount of years? Yeah, so I see by commercial space travel, you kind of mean going into space as an astronaut and paying to go on a holiday. As my money, I'm just going to go up. <laughs> um, I mean, on, on commercial the commercial sector being involved is really great because they're the ones that drive a lot of the innovation forwards. They free up the government to focus on other things so companies can then focus on different parts of innovation. Um, but if you're looking at space travel as a kind of holiday, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, I would love to do it. Um, let's be honest. Um, it would be great. But I think we need to be mindful of kind of whether it's worth it in terms of the environment um space flight at the moment is such a minute part of pollution but it doesn't mean we should be lax about it mm -hmm. so actually we've got to really carefully think about is it something that we want to encourage mm -hmm. um or is it something that we maybe need to try and decarbonize before we mm -hmm. start thinking about jaunting off to the moon for a weekend that's a really good point. We're in a, um, a good position in the fact that, you know, rather than when the Industrial Revolution started, people didn't have an understanding of the impact that that growth would have on the climate. But we now do have an understanding and therefore we can put checks and measures in place now, can't we? Yeah. Or that if we do move forward, the sector grows, that it's done with, with sense and with the climate in mind as well. So that's a very good point. Um, I think they're all our questions, Heidi. Thank you so much. I, I learned a lot, um, really, and great links and lots of different information that people, I'm sure, will be able to go away and investigate and explore. 
we'd love to have you back once you're you're moving through the qualifications and you've got some sort of you know real feeling of how students are performing on those and i'm sure it'd be really interesting to our, our students as well particularly those who are younger who are just exploring where to go with their qualifications um, to make contact we put our contact details up here just so there's any quick questions people have or just some follow-up but as we said at the beginning um, the links the slides and the information will be sent to those who booked on the eventbrite link if you didn't book on that link and you would like all the information please contact um, the email address on the screen now and we'll make sure we pass on the information to you as well so it just leaves me to say thank you again Heidi for for joining us and for delivering a really informative session thank you very much thank you so much for having me it's been a delight <laughs>